Those Hopkins people, they're so versatile, their audiovisual guys come in to do depression. And uh, in fact, I should tell you that that was really, uh, an, I made it look hard with Chris because uh, during that entire time, um, Jim was sending runners over to us to saying, you know, all you have to do is mute the mic. And I said, yeah, yeah, wait, we're busy, we're busy. And mute the mic. Oh, no, no, we're busy, we're busy. And then we figured out, oh, you have to mute the mic. And uh, so Jim was way ahead of us. Sorry, Jim, but I appreciate your input. So uh, the, uh, the bad news is, um, <clears throat> is that Chitra Krishnan and Doug Kerr and Sandy have infinite confidence in me, that they have now given me the uh, goal. Uh, it was just talking about demoralization. I could give a whole talk about depression. I could spend an hour minimum on, uh, and I could just talk about MS and... And, and then you throw in the cognitive impairment, and then right before we start, Sandy says, oh, you're going to do the IL-6 stuff, right? So uh, it's, you know, and I'm sort of envious because the speaker before me got fatigue. And, you know, she got, you know, a long time on one symptom, which uh, is one of the symptoms that you can get with depression. So my fun task is to untangle this. Hello? You know, this is, okay, so it's on. Testing, testing. That good? Okay, you can hear me? Great, because I, I hate to stay in one place. Now the good news is that um, this is an article that I shadow wrote. Uh, Sandy actually wrote most of it, but wrote it with my seal of approval. So the 20 pages here, which is two large talks, uh, is, is pretty much everything, everything I'm gonna talk about here today with just a couple things thrown in. So <clears throat> we're gonna motor in the uh, effort to make sure you get through dessert uh, and then have a chance to you know, go and head off. So um, <clears throat> what I wanted to start with is my daughter's favorite joke. Uh, my daughter's nine years old. Uh, I should have followed suit and have pictures of her because she's as cute as everybody else's kids up there, but you just have to take my word for it. And um, so she, uh, she loves this joke. A man walks into the doctor's office with a duck on his head, and the doctor comes out and says, may I help you? And the duck says, yes, can you get this man off my rear end? And the reason why I uh, like that joke uh, in this context is that Depression uh, is one of those disorders, one of those diseases that is often not appreciated. And what you think may be the problem is often not the problem that you think it is. So <clears throat> just to begin with, before we get to depression, we have to understand what depression is not. And depression is not being overwhelmed or overmastered or demoralized based on your circumstances. That is sadness, and, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. But just to show you that it's not inevitable, Depression is not an inevitability. It should not be a reaction to n these circumstances of having MS or any of these autoimmune diseases. I'm going to use MS a lot because it's the disorder that has the highest population and therefore the most studies done it. But we're, we have found, and I'll show you evidence for that, that other CNS autoimmune diseases like transverse myelitis, like neuromyelitis optica and others, uh, CNS vasculitis, have much in common. So this really applies to autoimmune uh, uh, diseases that affect the brain. But this is a study that was done, <clears throat> excuse me, and they did phone interviews of people on average nine years out since the diagnosis of their multiple sclerosis. And they said, tell us how you're doing, how are you functioning, what's going on, what has the impact been of having multiple sclerosis? And what I think is just, and again, there's going to be way more text than I'm going to be able to get through, so some of these I'm just going to, are reminders to me. What was interesting is that 20%, um, one in five said, you know, it caused such stress that it led to a deterioration in their relationships. You know, they found out who their real friends were and the people who didn't have the patience to, you know, sort of walk more slowly or, you know, come over and spend some time. Uh, those people went by the wayside. Um, <clears throat> that's one in five. One in three endorsed things that they said were demoralization. That's the category they put them into. But since depression occurs in one in four people at any given time, in cross-section, one in four people with MS, 25% are depressed, 50% lifetime incidents, that undoubtedly some of those people were depressed. But the important thing about this slide is that 60%, the majority of people, and that's twice as many as were demoralized, and three times as many that said that caused stress in the relationships, said that they endorsed things that the, uh, the uh, people doing the research could only say 
put it into the category of benefit finding. Well, what does that mean? That means people were saying in some ways this had enhanced their life. In some way, it had taught them things that they wouldn't have been taught before. And again, I, I should say that I feel very much that uh, Alan Rucker is sort of a brother from another mother. I agree with, you know, I, I loved his talk. And much of this, I would refer you back to the sort of rebirth and a chance to relook at life. So what does that mean, benefit finding? You know, it's easy to say that as a category. And most people probably scratch their heads and say, huh? These are the kinds of things. My friends and family are more helpful. I'm closer. I mean, I know men who got this and now actually got a chance to meet their children and spend time at home with them rather than the nine to five and you know, constantly, you know, cat's cradle, constantly be on the move. I'm closer to my significant other. I keep better in touch with family. I've learned to be more compassionate, more respectful to others, respect my uh, more feelings, communicate better, appreciate the importance of independence. Paula always tells me that ambulation is um, you know, wasted on the walking, and, uh, <laughs> and I agree. Um, so, but, but again, it's, it's just important to realize that depression is not the inevitable outcome. It, you, and you shouldn't accept it as the inevitable outcome. If you are depressed, the question is, why? Is it true clinical depression, or is it you know, just being demoralized, but it's not a normal state? You shouldn't normally just say, OK, this is, this is as good as it gets, and I just have to deal with that. Um, so uh, again, Alan Rucker and um, Cody Unser here uh, on, the, on the left, for your left, are people who you know, exemplify for me. You know, people say, you know, you'll never be normal again now that you know, you're in a wheelchair. Cody, at the age of 12, uh, got transverse myelitis. She's Alan Unser Jr.'s daughter, the race car legend. And, uh, and she actually is the one who said, you know, people tell her, you know, you'll never be normal again. She said, well, you know, if you can't be normal, be spectacular. And, um, and again, um, what, what is really, I think, important is I hate the term disabled, and I like the term better, alternatively able, because I will tell you, Alan, who's here, and, you know, he's never in L.A. because he's always going around talking to people, travels way more than I do. Uh, and, uh, and Cody, who can balance, you know, just do a wheelie anywhere she goes at all times and has you know, had an audience with George Bush to talk about stem cells. This from a prima donna brat before the age of 12, then with the onset of the transverse myelitis sort of bloomed into the most wonderful uh, young woman who now has taken a leadership role in sort of advocating for women and uh, with, with uh, alternatively abled situations. So again, it's phenomenal. And uh, you know, Alan is, again, another example of what the extraordinary things one can do. And again, I think uh, it was actually last night I was having a discussion with Paula and her husband, Mike. And uh, he was talking about how the other term from disabled is, is able-bodied. And I think he pointed out a very good point that able-bodied doesn't always uh, refer to above the neck. So you can be able-bodied and walking and talking and, and the like, but still suffering greatly. So you know, these terms, able-bodied, uh, uh, disabled, they're, they're problematic. So anatomy of despair. Really, the two differentials are demoralization and depression. So you know, people often, the, the, the terms are very vague. People often say, you know, I went to this movie last night. It was so depressing. And you know, I woke up today. I was so depressed. They don't mean that there was a chemical change in their brain, and they woke up, and they needed to go get psychotherapy and take Zoloft. That's not what they mean. They mean that their mood plummeted, and they were sad as a result. But that's not clinical depression. They're really talking about the syndrome that can happen to people in the extreme forms of sadness, which is demoralization. And demoralization is really this state of helplessness, hopelessness, confusion. And basically, we all have our limits. And that limit is vary, varies based on our genetic predisposition, meaning our temperament, what we're born with. It varies based on our sleep, our pain levels, and the like, our level of support. But that threshold, once crossed, puts us in a situation where we are overwhelmed. And suddenly, all our coping mechanisms, you know, whether it's um, denial, and denial is a great coping mechanism in many circumstances. Uh, and you know, we could have a whole discussion about you know, Alan saying he doesn't view himself in the wheelchair. Uh, and you know, Maggie could have a, a very lengthy discussion with you about that as well. But you know, this sort of viewing oneself uh, is, is, in a sense, 
a refusal to let yourself be pegged in a particular box and denying what other people view you as and taking control of it. So that's a great coping strategy, but at some point, uh, and everybody needs to be flexible, but at some point your coping strategies are gonna be overwhelmed. And when that happens, you know it happens because what it feels like is you fail to meet the expectations. Usually it's the expectations of yourself. Okay, usually it's that, you know, I'm just no good. I, just I should be able to pull myself up by my own bootstraps here. I just can't get through this. And I'm letting my family down. I'm letting myself down. This feeling of being unable to cope with the situation but trapped. I can't deal with all of these things, and I can't get out of it. So there's no alternative but to deal with it, but I can't deal with it. And this feeling of being isolated. I'm the only one who, who feels this way. No one understands what I'm feeling. Now, um, so let me, uh, actually, I think I just put that uh, in, uh, that slide, and I'll get to that in one second. So the way you handle this is to realize that when confronted by overwhelming uh, situations that, that, uh, that exceed one's ability to cope, what you need to do is break this huge monolith down into its basic components and begin, as Alan had discussed, to, to have small victories which can lead to larger victories. By winning the small battles, you can win the war. So just as an example, you know, patients come to me and they say, you know, I just, now I can't shop for my family. Well, why not? Because I have to, you know, use my walker and those people are just flying up and down the aisles and they don't wait, they cut me off and, you know, it's amazing uh, in this country how people will just, you know, out of my way and they want to get by you. Um, <clears throat> And I, you know, I said to this woman, I said, well, have you gone after hours, normal shopping hours, when other people aren't there, and you use the, you know, the, the uh, cart as your wheelchair? And she said, oh, I didn't think of that. So she went out, and she was able to shop off hours where people weren't overwhelming. And she came back, she said, you know, Dr. Kaplan, big smile on her face, I shopped for the first time in a year. And I brought that food home, and I could cook it for my family. And I felt, again, like I was back to being able to help my family. And that small victory for her was incredibly meaningful. And then she went on to win other victories. And I could just go on and on about the victories. I mean, to me, the victories, uh, the, the despair is the same when people get overwhelmed. And how people win victories one at a time is the most amazing thing to watch uh, and the amazing thing to be a part of. So I really encourage you, I know I'm spending too much time on this, but to think about it. Now, this is a very complicated topic because I don't have the answer, and I would welcome you to come and teach me about this, but there is this double-edged sword, you know, and people talk about, you know, complaining. You know, this person was really, you know, uh, amazing because uh, never complained. Um, and there is an element to, and I can understand why people would be uh, impressed by people who don't complain. But on the other hand, what I see a lot of is people don't come and get the help they need because they feel that it's complaining. I don't want to burden a psychiatrist by going to see a psychiatrist. I don't want to waste his time. I'm not worthy of that. I don't want to go just talk to someone. I'm lucky that I'm walking when you know, Paul is in a wheelchair and Jim is uh, you know, on a ventilator. I'm lucky. I shouldn't burden anybody with that. And um, so there is a difference between complaining and despairing. So, just complaining is something we all need to do at some point to blow off some steam. Uh, feelings in action, meaning I couldn't agree more that if your complaining is the excuse for not doing anything or not taking control or not moving forward, that's a problem. But it doesn't mean just because you feel like complaining that you're going to act in a way that means you don't move forward. Uh, and also, accepting help and burdening others are very different. And there is this tremendous double standard, because I know everybody in this room at some point in their life has gone through the situation where they say, you know, I just don't want to burden someone else with how I'm feeling or what I'm going through or what's going on. And yet, if, that, if one of your dear friends or family member came to you and said, look, you probably don't have time, I'm just, I just really down, and you'd say, no, tell me about it. What's going on? How can I help? And so there's this tremendous double standard. It's like complaining is what we always view ourselves as doing. That's a bad thing. But helping other people is something we like to do. I mean, good people like to help other people. So it's a very, very complicated thing. And I think the best I can give you is that you really need to go back to basics. And the basics for me are to remember the fundamentals. And the fundamentals, I can tell you, for all of medicine, I make the argument, these are the fundamentals. I'm worried about someone's function 
their quality of life, their longevity, and then their comfort. And people always come in and they say, you know, Dr. Kaplan, do you have anything for a headache? A patient in the HIV clinic said, and I said, sure, um, I'm sure I do, but you got to tell me about the headache. Well, when I put cocaine into a needle, it injected into my carotid artery, I get this huge headache. I need something for a headache. What do you got? And, you know, so I say, look, you're worried about your comfort, but I'm worried about you getting shot and the strokes and all of this. So I had to teach them that the comfort isn't the top of the list. That what's at the top, I mean, I could hang anybody uh, up to morphine and just a drip and you'd feel great. Um, but you wouldn't be functional. So the important thing is you got to remember, if complaining impairs your function, quality of life, longevity, and comfort, then you're in trouble. On the other hand, it may enhance all of those. So that's the best I can do because this is a difficult topic for me to sort of get my arms completely around. I, I, I'm not trying to make light of the fact that many people that I consider heroes who come out like Jim does and is here at great risk to himself. I mean, Jim has gone to conferences like this where his uh, you know, ventilator broke down and he almost died just coming out to a conference like this. So he's taking great risk to be here, and he's not complaining at all. And I have nothing but the utmost respect. On the other hand, when people get depressed, you got to overcome that. When people need help, you have to get over the idea that that is complaining. I know I belabored that. So who cares for the caregivers? Very important to realize that it's not a zero-sum game. It's not, gee, I am uh, you know, taking care of this person. It's not my body that has the MS or TM. It's the body of my loved one. So how can I possibly go see a movie and leave my loved one at home? who's fatigued and can't go. I need to stay here, and I can't go to my own doctor's appointments, and I can't do anything like that. And the most important thing to realize is that the caregivers always get left out of the equation, in part because they leave themselves out, in part because they're the, the people with the illness sometimes leave them out, uh, and in part because the medical, uh, the care providers leave them out. So I always do this, but I'm not going to. But I, just take my word for it. If I said, how many people here um, have been to the doctors, you know, sorry, have an autoimmune disease, half the hands would go up and I'd say, how many people are, you know, caregivers or significant others? The other half of the arms go up. And when I say, well, how many people who are the caregivers have had the doctor take you aside and spend time just with you? And it's always like 1%. So the people who are the caregivers are not getting the help and support that the patients are. And again, the analogy that I use, and I think it's an apt analogy, is that when the oxygen mask drop down in the airplane, they tell you, people traveling with people who need assistance, who do you put the oxygen mask on first, yourself or your, the, the children or the people who need assistance? Yeah, and it's interesting because even people who are smart enough to know that's the answer, like a, a woman that I was speaking to yesterday, sort of look at, look, she looked at me sheepishly, she said, well, I know the answer. The correct answer is myself, but I put it on my loved one first. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the answer is really that how can I possibly take care of myself when my loved one? And what I can tell you is for the people here whose bodies are affected, just realize it's your body, but it's the body of the person that, that your loved ones have tied their wagon to in sickness and in health. So you're in it together, and if you're up a creek, with, it's bad enough, and if you lose your paddle, you're in real trouble. So make sure that you as the caregivers and you as the people affected, make sure that that caregiver has a chance to recharge their engines so they can get out, so they can get enough oxygen, because when that oxygen gets sucked out of that plane, you have 30 seconds before you pass out, and if you're fighting with your kid to get that oxygen mass on, you will pass out and not be able to save them when they pass out. If, on the other end, you put the oxygen mask on yourself, you could actually do it very efficiently, just time 30 seconds, and then put it on them when they pass out. That would be very easy. Um, so it's just important to know that you need to be there. You need to take care of yourself. So the bluebird of happiness, long absent from his life, Ned is visited by the chicken of depression. And here's what we're going to talk about. Poor Ned. Poor Ned here, he's alone, he's isolated, he's let himself go, his place go, and he's turned to alcohol. Self-medicating with alcohol seems like a really great idea at the time, but unfortunately alcohol is a CNS depressant. It worsens depression, so you have to keep drinking because when you're not drinking, you're really depressed. Uh, it's just that it's sort of an anesthetic when you're drunk. 
So we've known about depression for 2,400 years. It was originally called melancholia, which in some ways is a better term than depression, because depression sounds like a dip in the road or a downturn in the stock market. But we know that Hippocrates, who this is 2,400 years ago, termed this condition melancholia, which he described basically the way we describe it. And one of the things I just want you to know is that you, unless you've had depression yourself and gotten well or seen a loved one, go through that, you really don't know what depression is. And it's really too bad because the stigma in this country about mental illness is far worse than the stigma in this country is about HIV, for example. So I can name for you Arthur Ashe and Julius Irving and you know, a number, uh, you know, Rock Hudson, a number of, Elizabeth Taylor. Okay, how many people can name people who spend their time advocating for depression, for schizophrenia, for mental health? And it, you can't. And at Johns Hopkins, med, I can get online and I can read about anybody's HIV status. It's just on the computer. It's on their medical records. But I, if I'm not a psychiatrist, I can't read about someone's mental health. I can't get access to the records. They're not there. So the stigma about mental health is worse than the stigma about even HIV. And the problem with that is that we don't understand it in part because we don't talk about it. And if you talk about it, you realize that Winston Churchill and Vincent Van Gogh and Abraham Lincoln and the, some of the greatest people uh, who have lived it, at any time of any century have been people affected by depression. Uh, and Kay Jamison, my mentor and friend, has written a book, Touched with Fire, about how there's, you know, writers have about a 60% prevalence of depression and poets 80% of bipolar disorder in large part because when you get re, you know you 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 visit the extremes of human existence the low lows and the high highs and then you come back and you tell the rest of us about it but you also want someone who's crazy enough to go i think we should go in there and we'll take this fort and we're going to you know keep going until we get there and you know you need someone like that why have these illnesses become, continued to be so common in our populations even though it's a lethal illness Suicide is a ca major cause of death. In this country, one in eight women will, uh, sorry, the cause of death, it's the eighth leading cause of death in women, suicide in our, in our country, and the 11th in men. So why is this survived? Because there are advantages to it. Um, but what I just want you to know as just one example is just because you have ALS, for instance, Tuesdays with Maury, go read the book, he wasn't depressed right up until the very end, and we know in clinical studies that the rates of depression in people with ALS are no higher than the general population. And why is that? Because it's the nerves that go and plug into the muscles that are affected in ALS, and that's not where the mood thermostat is. And just very briefly, they are now doing stimulators, putting electrical stimulators in the patient's brains. You may have heard of this with Parkinson's disease. And you see people doing this, and then they turn the stimulator on, and if they have it in the right place, they do this. And it's pretty amazing, except when they've done this, they've found that one in 25 people with it will attempt suicide, which is a problem. And they've actually seen that, um, that when they put that electrode just into the wrong place, there was a sort of uh, a, a very famous case that was written about a woman who, when they turned that simulator on, she described it was like a dark cloud, an anti-adrenaline sort of filled the room. She began to cry, felt hopeless, helpless, despairing, and she said, uh, turn that button off. They turned it off, and suddenly the clouds lifted. Suddenly she became her old self. And that was the mood thermostat. There is a mood thermostat in the brain, and just like the thermostat in the room, if it gets stuck, you're going to stay depressed. And again, depression is not just a state of mind or weakness. There is a biology to it. In fact, anything that affects the brain can cause depression. And strokes are an example. Strokes were the first biological insult to the brain that was described that basically was accepted in the 70s as a cause of depression. Before that, it was always assumed to be either a reaction, reaction to circumstances, or um, if you listen to Freud, uh, in men it was because they were uh, losing their and I'm not making this up, by the way. Freud thought it was that they were losing their libidinal fluids by too much ejaculation that caused depression, OK? So Freud really sort of set us back a little bit in the research of depression, because that's not where the money was. But the important thing to notice about this list is anything including alcohol and cocaine is great for causing depression. If you want to get depressed, cocaine's the thing. Um, and interferon, which you use for hepatitis C treatment. But MS has the highest rate of depression of any medical, neurological, or surgical illness that has ever been studied. 
and again, uh, just very high rates of, of suicide from depression. This is, I can't understand a word you're saying, Roger, have you got a gun in your mouth? And what I will tell you is, yeah, women attempt suicide three times more often than men, men commit suicide three times more often than women, uh, right, and all the charts are going down, someone's pointing out this doctor's not having a good outcome. And the reason why that is, is because women try to kill themselves, how? They overdose, they go, they get their stomach pumped and charcoal, and men use what? Guns, and there's a very, very, very little margin for error with a gun. And as a result, it's really lethal. So, but the important thing to know, and this I think is, is worth stressing, is that the rates of depression in MS and TM, as we'll see in one second, are equivalent between men and women, as opposed to in the general population from idiopathic, and I love Ben Greenberg's sort of definition of idiopathic, but uh, he said idiopathic is when the doctors are idiots and the patients are pathetic. For those people who weren't here for that lecture, it's just brilliant. Um, but, uh, but in any case, the important thing to know is that in this disorder, it's equivalent rates because the MS causes the depression, as opposed to the fact that the biology is such that women, uh, there's clearly a hormonal link, postpartum depression is, is very common time for depression and perimenopausal depression, there's clearly a link uh, to it as a result of that. So um, I'm just going to keep going here. So what depression is not? Then how do you diagnose depression? Well, the first thing you have to remember is it's not normal sadness. It's not demoralization. Sadness is depression with a small d. It's just one symptom. And the way I try to tell this to the, neuro uh, to the neurology, but also the medical residents, is that because they think very much about diagnostic criteria and how you diagnose an illness, I say cough. Uh, is to depression, sorry, cough is to pneumonia what sadness is to depression. So you can have a cough that is an indicator of pneumonia, but someone will cough at some point during the course of you know, this talk or uh, lunch, and it's not as a result of pneumonia. It's dry air, it's asthma, it's choking on uh, you know, the wonderful food. Um, not every cough is a result of pneumonia. Sometimes you get pneumonia without a cough, particularly in the young and the very old. Irritability is what you see in the young and the very old, instead of sadness, by the way, but you often don't get cough, uh, sometimes pneumonia presents without a cough, so you gotta consider the company that the cough keeps. If it's a cough with fever and a rapid breathing and a little fuzzy thing on the, uh, what, that represents consolidation, lots of fluid in the lung, uh, on an x-ray, we call that pneumonia. This is what we call depression. And again, this is in the newsletter, SIG EM CAPS is how I remember it, and it stands for sleep, Usually early morning awakenings is classic. Lots of people can't fall asleep at night because they're stressed and thinking about a lot of things. But waking up in the morning, not being able to fall back asleep and just watching the clock turn, that's less common with just stress. And that can be an indicator, but remember, it's just one symptom. Loss of interest or pleasure. Your get up and go has gotten up and gone. This feeling of guilt or worthlessness, which really gets in the way, I'm just gonna go complain, I don't want anybody to uh, have to be burdened by it. So that loss of pleasure is devastating, both into the quality of life of the person, but also in their ability to get help. Um, loss of energy or fatigue, and we'll return to that in a minute. There's that sadness, mood, but it's just one of the symptoms, and you don't have to have it. Uh, concentration or cognitive impairment, which in depression can be so bad it looks like Alzheimer's disease, and I've seen people in nursing homes that actually had depression, treated their depression, and they go home and they live independently. So it can be really, really devastating, these things. Appetite, either comfort, grazing, uh, chocolate in particular seems, many of my women patients say, is hard to lay off when they're depressed. And that's because you know that sense of satisfaction is gone, so you have to keep eating to try to get that satiation. Um, food doesn't taste as good, there's biological changes. And psychomotor retardation, which just means if you know, your loved ones who really know you can look at you and see that you're just not yourself. You're moving more slowly, thinking more slowly. And then suicidal ideations or thoughts of death. If you have f at least five of those nine symptoms, one of which must be decreased interest or decreased mood, for greater than two weeks, you bought yourself the diagnosis of major depression or clinical depression. If you have those symptoms, uh, the more symptoms you have, the more likely you are to have a good response to treatment. This says, after many years of marital bliss, tension enters the Kent household, and Lois Lane is embroidering stupid on uh, Superman's cape. And it just reminds me to make sure you know that, um, that if you're not sure if you're depressed, go ask your spouse. 
because they will tell you. And if there's one question I, I ask the spouse, and it's always the spouse, you know, people who are depressed are usually there because the spouse said, you got to go see somebody because I just can't live with you like this. It's just too depressing. And um, they come into the office, and if there's one question I can ask the significant other, it's usually, is this the same person you married? And the inevitable answer is, they have changed fundamentally. This is not the person I married. They have, their get up and go has gotten up and gone. They're not as interested in doing things. They're not you know, gregarious. They are withdrawn. They just you know, sort of slink away to their own house. So I can't tell you if uh, Superman is depressed and not so super anymore. Uh, he's not going out, or if Lois Lane is depressed and she's not really enamored with Superman. But I can tell you, it's the family members that get the brunt. Now, family members, let me tell you why you get the brunt. It's because it takes a huge amount of concentration to act like you're not depressed and go out into public when you're depressed. And so it's like any conversation you're having, you're, you're spending so much time just trying to not look depressed that it's like you're constantly running a marathon to not look depressed and push yourself. So when you get home, the good news is that you get to just be yourself, your old depressed self, your old irritable depressed self. And so the reason is not, and people often say, you know, he goes out to parties and he's fine. He comes home and he's grumpy. And the reason is that that's how they really are. That's their state of depression, and they're faking it uh, when they go out. So it's nothing personal. You just know them when they're really themselves. Um, so we have known, this is Jean-Martin Charcot, the father of MS, the first person to ever describe multiple sclerosis. The criteria he used is the same, we know the same symptomatology as we use today. And interestingly enough, back in 1868, when he presented Mademoiselle V as the very first patient, she was described as having periods of serious depression accompanied by paranoia that caused her to think Charcot, her doctor, was trying to poison her. And so she wasn't eating and had to have her stomach uh, a tube put down uh, in order to feed her so she didn't die during these periods. So the very first patient with MS was so depressed she almost died, not from the MS, but because of the depression, or really from the MS causing her depression. And you'd think that people would have caught on if it was the very first patient, but it was another hundred years before people even began to return to say, gee, is there a higher rate of depression in MS? And what's interesting is that in part they didn't want to do that because they said, look, they already have MS. Now you're going to tell them that they're depressed? I mean, you can't burden them with that. And yet it's the depression that can be so devastating and so incapacitating. So again, lifetime prevalence, 50% or more people with MS and TM and NMO from the studies we have are, uh, are going to get a clinical depression in cross-section. At any given time, it's one in four people. Now, cognitive impairment, 50% of people with MS have some degree of cognitive impairment. Luckily, it's only like 5% to 8% of people who had so significant cognitive impairment that it's really uh, effectively looks like a dementia. So I'm going to just summarize a lot of literature and tell you that we know that from this kind of evidence, uh, at least we believe from this kind of evidence, that depression is caused in MS by inflammation. And what's the evidence? Well, to begin with, it doesn't correlate with disability. So you'd have to say Jim, by definition, should be more depressed if it's just a reaction to life circumstance than, um, than someone else who's walking and talking but you know, sitting here in tremendous pain. And it doesn't correlate. It's not, gee, you'd be depressed too, because then you should, should correlate with how disabled you are. And there's no correlation. Instead, it's periods of immune activation when the immune system is going. And remember, you don't always know if you're having an exacerbation. A lot of the activity happens below the surface. But it's during periods of immune activation that people get depressed and they have suicide attempts. So depression has a devastating impact on people's quality of life, function, cognition, fatigue, and longevity. It is the primary determining factor in the studies that have been done. Uh, you, know, I, I, it, you know, I know this because I've been taught this by uh, my patients, but people adjust to the wheelchairs really quickly. That's not nearly as depressing, says Alan Rucker. He confirms it. But they don't adjust to the depression, okay? Depression, remember, people with depression try to kill themselves. There's nothing more important to them than the depression. Nothing is meaningful. And it is the number one correlation of quality of life. It is also, um, and more devastating than the disability, fatigue, or cognitive impairment, it's also the number one correlate of the quality of life of the significant other. So if you're not going to get your depression treated for yourself, 
then you got to think about getting it treated for your loved one because it's also the number one correlation of what you can do to improve the quality of life of your loved ones. It causes disruption of social support, a major cause of time lost from work, and a major cause of people not being willing to take their medication or go to rehab or exercise or what have you. Of course, exercise turns out to be a very good antidepressant. The problem is you have to keep exercising to get the antidepressant effects, but it's very important, and it can be just as good as medication if you exercise at least three times a week and for an hour. So some degree of cognitive impairment occurs in 50% of people with MS. Unfortunately, I don't have time to get into the full discussion, but what I do want you to know that the kinds of things is memory recall, but it's like on the tip of your tongue. It's like give you a multiple choice list and you can get it. It's not like an Alzheimer's disease where they'll say that's the, um, the, the, the clock and wrist. You know, it's gone. They can't get it. But you give them a list, people with MS, and it's a face of the watch. That's right, it's the face. This part of the watch, it's the clasp. Okay? If you give them a list, they'll get it every time. But it might not come to them. It's just on the tip of their tongue. And similarly, processing speed. People just think a little slower so that people giving talks like I'm giving right now is a nightmare for people with MS because it goes quickly, uh, which is why it's written uh, in this, thank God Sandy made sure it was all written down for future reference. But, um, but uh, and also this sort of set shifting. Like I'm on the phone and I'm trying to do double the recipe and then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the kitchen trying to double the recipe. The phone rings, I go over to get the phone, I come back, oh, you know, no clue what I was doing. The shifting from one to the next. And I will tell you that these things are very common. Unfortunately, as my wife points out to me, they're also common with aging. So I say, I don't know, honey, I'm you know, forgetting these things. Yeah, you're not as, oh, by the way, I'm not as young as I look. People think I look like Harry Potter and the like. But, uh, but in fact, I've been at Hopkins for 16 years, so I'm not, uh, people say I look very young. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, so, but it's important to just realize that depression itself has a very similar kind of cognitive impairment. And so people come in and they say, oh, you know, I, I can't focus, I can't concentrate, and just like fatigue, if there's one take home message I would have for you, is the only thing I really need to know to know whether or not it's gonna be related to depression or some other cause, or if it's MS related, is that cognitive impairment in MS from lesions and inflammation in the brain is like cognitive impairment from any other cause. The brain doesn't just suddenly heal up on some days and then get worse on others. So the one question I always ask patients are, are there some parts of the day that are better, better than others? Because depression often has a diurnal variation. Morning's really bad, evening's better, okay? You're not depressed because of your circumstances if you're really depressed in the morning, but by the evening you're feeling good because your circumstances are still the same. That's a clinical depression. And similarly, if there are some weeks that are better than others, or gee, it was much better when I was off that medicine uh, and much worse on that medicine, those are the kinds of things I want to hear from people. That if there's a big variation and their concentration is better at times and worse than others, I want to be the detective to go in and figure out what is causing it to worsen because that's not MS. And I've had people come in who you know, basically were not functional. And by the way, you know, the kinds of functional problems people, cognitive problems people with depression have is they don't try. So you say, oh, what's the name of this? Uh, the front of the watch. And they say, oh, I don't know. No, really, just what's the name of it? I can't tell you for the life of me. I just haven't been able to concentrate. But you say, no, 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 really, just think about it for a minute. Uh, it's the face, okay? It's that giving up that comes uh, with depression. Often. So those are just some hints, but it's not as easy as it may sound. That's why you need to go to someone who's trained in these symptoms in order to really figure it out. If it's not due to the MS, which it certainly can be, uh, depression, fatigue, medications, 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 sort of like location, 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 uh, normal aging process. So you treat the specific causes, know the enemy, learn adaptive coping strategies. If it is MS, you know, those post-its on the mirror in the mornings when you get up, don't forget to take your medicine, those can go a long way. Uh, little alarms, you know, I, I have these pill boxes that I uh, give to patients that have little alarms on them and tell them at what point of the day they should be taking their medicines. And you can get these from Walmart for like a song, 20 bucks. And So these are coping strategies. There are some medications and we're working on trying to come up with better ways of intervening to improve people's concentration. Right now, it's only, even the best medicines we have are on average about 10% effective. And then, you know, make sure you maximize your sleep and your exercise and relaxation and the like. 
So depression and fatigue, and again, the one take home message is, as you sort of heard, normal fatigue and MS is you hit the wall, bam. And usually it's about two or three o'clock, and then if you rest, you can recharge your en engines. In studies that were done that looked at what they defined as disabling fatigue, where people were often or almost always fatigued and it interfered with their activities, 80% of those people, I'm sorry, 70% of those people were depressed, okay? So yeah, the fatigue in MS and all these autoimmune diseases can be devastating, but it shouldn't be every minute of every second of every day, okay? And if it is, that's probably uh, depression, or at least it needs to be evaluated. Now, suicide is a really bad thing. Um, and I try to tell my patients, suicide, you know, depression is uh, a short-term problem. You need a short-term solution, you know, uh, and suicide is the longest-term solution. It's, you know, like herpes and luggage. It never goes away. I can get my patients better as long as they don't kill themselves, I tell them, because that's going to make it much harder to get them better. And unfortunately, 30% of patients with MS have thoughts of wanting to commit suicide, and uh, 6 to 12% attempt. It's the third leading cause of death in multiple sclerosis. So transverse myelitis. And I can't go through the story and do it justice, but I will tell you that Doug came to me and said, I think my patient's with TM. Can you come? Can you be a psychiatrist in the clinic? Uh, so after he hired uh, Chitra and lured her to stay with him, uh, uh, I fell into the same uh, Doug fly trap, and uh, I was stuck. Uh, went to one conference like this, and that was it. I met people like are sitting in the audience, and I was hooked, addicted. And I said, well, what do we know about TM? I really, he said, I really want to do TM. I need someone to help. I said, great, Doug, great. I, you know, I, I have a PhD. I'm a neuroscientist like Doug. I said, great. Tell me what you know about it. And he said, oh, well, here's what we know. <laughs> Oops. Here's what we know. I said, great. We know nothing about it. And it's a spinal cord disease, and the brain is up here, and the spine's down here. He said, but I really think that they're depressed. And I said, they're demoralized, Doug, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to send poor Chitra Krishnan into the clinic and to go and evaluate the patients at this time. Now I'm sending uh, poor Carrie Trecker uh, into the clinics uh, to, to do this uh, and to evaluate these patients. And what she found uh, was that the rates of depression, this shows the general population. Blue is mild to moderate depression. Uh, by the way, I'm blue-green colorblind, so these could be like orange and yellow. But I think that's blue and dark blue. Is that close? Um, and then, uh, again, in MS, you see 31% mild to moderate, 8% severe. And in TM, what Chitra found was it was more patients were severely depressed, 16 versus 8%. So it had very high rates of depression that no one had ever described before, but no one had ever had a TM clinic before Doug started one. And so I said, well, gee, maybe the depression is the canary in the coal mine, that there is some brain involvement. I said, Doug, by the way, how do you diagnose TM? He said, well, you stick a needle in someone's back, and if there are cells, uh, that's one way. Or if you see you know, that there's inflammation going on in the brain, uh, then that's one way. And I said, oh, right, the cerebral spinal fluid bathes the whole brain. And if you can just take that and see that there's evidence of cells and inflammation and stuff going on, that sounds like maybe it could affect the brain. And if it did, then you might expect to see cognitive impairment. And the, again, I think it's purple. Uh, the dark purple at the bottom uh, basically is, shows you that the pattern of cognitive impairment in MS is just like the pattern of cognitive impairment in TM. It's that word finding trouble, the same kind of thing I just described. That's what we found. And it didn't correlate with disability, uh, meaning you know, whether you had sexual dysfunction or not didn't correlate with your depression. This shows disability getting worse to the right and depression getting worse up here. No correlate with sexual function, no correlating with bladder, no correlating with motor. And it did have a small correlation, uh, 0.3, which means it accounted for 10% of the variability with pain. And it is absolutely true that people can adjust to being in the wheelchair, but they can't adjust to being in the wheelchair in pain. Right, John? Yeah. So John, first conference I went to in Seattle, John had to lay in a, you know, some reclining chair, and he was just, you could just tell he had pain written all over his face. And now he comes up to me today, and he says, hey, Dr. Kaplan, how you doing? I was like, whoa, whoa. And uh, he said, I got a nerve stimulator implanted, and I've got the clonidine, and his wife's smiling, and he's smiling, and the pain really can worsen someone's entire life. It can also, by the way, set off depression. So the two are very intimately linked. 
And this is what we found in the TM clinic. This shows the rate of suicide here uh, from depression, 83 per 100,000, from, uh, from MS, 168, and from TM, it's one in 100 that we've had in the clinic so far. Now, it is true that for you to get to Johns Hopkins, you probably have more severe TM that you really had to keep going and finding someone, but the rates of suicide in TM are way, way high. And unfortunately, it happens often in people that we've seen and sent them back home, uh, and we hear about it later, or people who are waiting to get in to be seen. So it is a lethal consequence. So I said, Doug, you know, we got to figure this out. You could draw off the cerebral spinal fluid, and because all of you gave CSF to Ben, uh, many of you did, these, we were able to do this. So we took the cerebral spinal fluid, did this in Doug's lab, Doug uh, sort of looking over Doug's shoulder for most of it. And uh, we know that giving cytokines to animals makes them not groom, and they don't want to press the lever to get sweets, and they don't want to you know, inspect uh, the mouse of the other sex. They sort of look depressed. And if you give cytokines to humans, they also get depressed. So we looked at the CSF. We found that you know, all of these, one means the exact same levels of these cytokines. Cytokines are the neurotransmitters of the immune system. It's what one immune cell uses to talk to another immune cell. And we saw the same levels of cytokines uh, uh, for, for the, for, compared to patients who had just infections as opposed to an autoimmune disease, for everything except IL-6. And I, that's a broken graph because it's actually 300-fold elevated. I'd have to draw it, and it would go through the roof, maybe to the third floor, to draw that in real scale. Huge elevated levels of IL-6 is what we found. And then, again, all work done in Doug's lab, and we have published it uh, with Doug, is we've shown that IL-6 is necessary spinal cord injury in TM. If you take someone's CSF who had really aggressive TM and you put it on a spinal cord in the dish in the lab, it kills those cells, 80% of those cells in the, in the dish. Um, however, if you pull out only IL-6, leave the other 1,000 proteins alone, using an antibody, a specific uh, sort of... Um, protein-seeking missile that you can use to pull out just IL-6 and leave every other IL on the planet in there, you remove 100% of the killing activity of that CSF. And when we then did the cruel thing, but it's important in order to be able to study this in the lab, when you put IL-6 into the spinal cord of a rat, and you looked at it, it looked fine one day later, two days later, it's walking around, everything's good, it's slowly getting IL-6 uh, through this sort of like the reverse of what women get epidurals when they're, uh, you know, uh, getting, uh, when they're pregnant. Um, and by day three, they start to, you know, they're sort of tripping a little bit. And by day five, they're dragging their back legs. And when you look at the spinal cord, it's, it looks just like patients with transverse myelitis. So we now know that it's necessary and sufficient. And what, what we then did was sort of said, okay, IL-6 is doing something, and we then went through the pathway of what IL-6 turns on, uh, who IL-6 is talking to, and then what that protein is talking to. And it sort of went like this. There was some trigger. We still don't know exactly what it is. Um, then IL-6 gets activated. We know that it turns on a protein called STAT3 INOS, releases this toxic protein, nitric oxide. It's toxic in large amounts, I should say. In small amounts, it's how Viagra works. But in large amounts, it's bad. Small amounts, I'm all for it. Uh, and, uh, and then this protein PARP, and from that now, we are able to, to come up with ways uh, for treatments that are actually ongoing. Statins block this pathway, erythropoietin, EPO, thalidomide, minocycline, and all of these things are underway. So once you know the pathway, you can then intervene. But that was only because it started with Doug saying, hey, Adam, I think these patients are really in distress. Only because he listened to people with TM did that lead to the discovery of you know, having some crazy psychiatrist come in and collaborate with him. Uh, so I, I have no time to go into this. It, it just will tell you that we're now investigating how the biology of the IL-6, it turns on cortisol, which is the stress hormone. That blocks the production of new neurons in the brain. You see actual shrinkage of the hippocampus in people. The hippocampus is where memory is regulated, also mood. It blocks uh, the growth of new neurons. You get hippocampal shrinkage, which you do see in patients with depression. And then you get depression and cognitive impairment. This is the model. We know that antidepressants stimulate the growth of new neurons. And we now actually have a biological model that we're testing in the lab for the basis of depression in TM and MS. Now, here's the problem. When patients come to me, they often need to be detoxed. 
Because if you don't recognize the depression and you treat it symptomatically, well, they're not sleeping. So that insomnia is just because of their stress. So you put them on Valium, right? Except the problem is they also have concentration problems. But that's just their MS memory problems. So you put them on some medicine uh, like Aricept that has some evidence that it's about 10% effective. Except Aricept affects people's appetite. So now they're getting weight loss and decreased energy. And that's also causing trouble. And during the day, they're fatigued. And because they're fatigued during the day, you got to give them a stimulant. You put them on Provigil or Ritalin or something. Well, they're not sleeping very well, so you got to up the Valium at night. And now their concentration is, you know, Valium is alcohol in a pill. It works exactly at the same receptors alcohol does. And if you go up high enough, you're drunk. And that doesn't help your concentration. So what I often need to do is if you treat it symptom by symptom by symptom, you're in real trouble. If you treat the depression underlying all of these, you can get people off all of these drugs. So I'm not pro-drug. I don't think everybody should be on everything. I think you should be really wise and cautious and careful in getting the right diagnosis. So I get these calls all the time. People say, oh, my patient's really uh, you know, aggressive. What do you have for aggressiveness? What pill can you pull out of your, like I have a whole sort of pack of pills. And I, Throw this one at them. Uh, and it's sort of like me calling my colleagues and say, oh, you know, my patient seems to be like you know, a little limp in his wrist. What, what do you got for limp in the wrist syndrome? And you know you got to make the diagnosis. And if the diagnosis is depression, you need to recognize it. Now, why do you, why do you need to get it treated? Uh, of course, your daddy loves you. He's on Prozac. He loves everybody, OK? You need to get it recognized because the good news, the great news, is that it turns out even though MS and TM and NMO cause depression, Thankfully, we're, we're lucky enough that we stumbled upon these medications in the last 50 years that treat depression in all forms, all comers. So antidepressants work in these depressions. It didn't necessarily have to be that way, but it is that way that these antidepressants don't work upstream. They work downstream. So many causes of depression, antidepressants will help. Uh, this is Kay Jameson. She says, no pill can help me deal with the problem of not wanting to take pills. Likewise, no amount of psychotherapy alone can prevent my manias and depression. I don't think pills are the answer for everything. We know that talk therapy and medication works far better than either one alone. And exercise is very important. Is depression treatable? If we really cared about it, could we treat it? And this just shows you a study in the US Air Force in the 1990s that one in four deaths in the Air Force were due to suicide. And they said, gee. We should be able to stop that. We can't stop the unintentional injuries because the toys they play with are like semi-automatics and you know, air-to-land missiles and whatever. But we maybe can stop them from killing themselves. So they put this plan into place. And by the way, one important part of that plan was the top brass sending letters to everybody in the military saying, you are wise and brave if you seek help when you need it. If you complain in the right way at the right time to increase your function, that helps. And you can see over here that they went in 1994, they recognized 10 in 100,000 people were dying in the Air Force. They put this plan into place in some of the places in the Air Force in 1996, 97. And by 1998 and 99, they decreased the rate of suicide by 90%. If we really cared, this is a captive audience. They screened everybody at every visit. Even if they didn't visit, every year they got a screening for depression. And if you didn't get screened, you didn't get paid. You know, you were in trouble. So they also made each other responsible. If someone commits suicide under your watch, you're responsible. So um, also, I discussed this before when we were talking with Donna Jackson. Stress, cortisol worsens, uh, worsens MS, worsens the outcome. Uh, in a significant way. We've also found that patients who are depressed with MS, if you actually look at how aggressive their immune system is by drawing their blood, taking those white blood cells and giving them myelin, which is the, uh, as Ben described, the insulation that gets ripped off, they're twice as aggressive against that myelin if the patient's depressed. They treat the depression and it comes back down to control levels. So it looks like not only can depression be a risk factor for getting worse conditions uh, and worsening, but it looks like depression is also um, something that if you treat it, not only does MS cause depression, but treating the depression looks like it helps MS. Well, how can I say that? Because uh, I haven't actually proven that. Well, this got published two months ago. They did a double-blind study of Prozac, which is fluoxetine, in, on looking at disease activity in relapsing, uh, remitting multiple sclerosis. The best study you can do is a double-blind 
placebo-controlled studies. The patient didn't know what they were getting. The doctors didn't know what they were getting. And they gave them Prozac. And then they looked. And you can see those people on the Prozac, um, I, this just came out, so I put this together, had significantly less new enhancing lesions, placebo three enhancing lesions versus one in the Prozac, um, significantly fewer gadolinium enhancing lesions, 90 in Prozac versus 227 on the placebo, and uh, the scans showing enhancing lesions, they're all less on Prozac. Exacerbations were less, gadolinium enhancing lesions were less. So I'm not for just taking medicines willy-nilly, but if a patient comes to me and they have neuropathic pain, and they have severe depression, and they have um, urinary incontinence, and they have this biologically-based depression that's eating away at their brain, and I put them on a drug like a tricyclic antidepressant that treats neuropathic pain, and it treats um, uh, bladder uh, incontinence, and it treats this brain. We know that people who are depressed get shrinkage of their brain, and if you give them antidepressant, it doesn't shrink. In fact, it stimulates the growth of new neurons. Boy, if one drug will do all of that, and I can get them off all the other medicines that they were on for those symptoms, that's worthwhile. That's worth thinking about anyway. So depression is a two-way street. Uh, we sort of went through that. The one law that does not change is that everything changes in the hardships I was bearing today, only a breath away from the pleasures I would have tomorrow, and those pleasures are all the more richer. Uh, this is one of my heroes. Just so you know, Paula, I show this at all the talks I give to the medical doctors. And here Paula is, I have to just take a second. Here Paula is, she worked really hard. So at her high school graduation, she said, darn it, you know, people may not have talked to me, may, may not have you know, known who I was, but I'm walking across that stage to get my diploma. And she really worked hard, and she walked across that stage. Paula, right over there, walked across that stage. And they said to Paula, you know, you can never have a child because you're in a wheelchair and, you know, people in wheelchairs, they can't have children and, you know, you should just go get in bed and forget about it. And she said, um, <clears throat> wait a minute, Jesse, right here. And uh, she uh, did it and here she's got this strappingly handsome uh, baseball playing uh, guy turned physical therapist, Mike who some of you might have been privileged to talk to. And there she is with Jesse, who this is, a, Jesse's now a skateboarding, guitar playing, cool dude. A little bit of an old picture. That's from the last time uh, in Seattle that I was here. So I'll have to update that. And again, she has this wonderful quote, uh, we cannot control all of what happens with our bodies, and we cannot control what goes on in the world around us, but we do control how we think about and feel about ourselves and our families and the world we live in, and it is all good. Life is very, very good, right? Um, it is for her. And finally, um, you know, this is uh, at the last conference, Jim Lubin, the reason why we're here in Seattle, you've been told about. I went up to Jim and I said, you know, just the fact that you're out there is a huge inspiration. I've saved people's lives who didn't commit suicide because I said, look, Jim Lubin, don't tell me because you trip, you know, when you walk that life is not meaningful, or because you're in a wheelchair, life's not meaningful. Jim Lubin runs the TMA website. He sips and puffs Morse code on that straw he's got, and that is how he puts up on the website. And I, he sips and puffs Morse code and types faster than I can type with my hands, okay? That's alternatively able. That is not disabled. And I said, I said you know, to Jim, I said, you know, you're my hero because you, know, you risk your life to get out here. And he said, look, I'm not a hero. I I'm still able to do the things. You know, before I got TM, I was a kid who just, not a kid. I, I, how old were you, Jim? 21. A kid. Uh, <clears throat> I really am not 21, I swear. Um, and uh, I, he said, look, at 21, I just like to listen to music and play with computers. You know, I'm still able to do the things I endured before I got TM. I can still play around with computers, listen to music, and watch movies. Now I have more time to spend doing it. Okay? That's really accentuating the positive. When life isn't the way you like it, like it the way it is one day at a time. And the part of the quote I didn't include was, but it's all possible because of the support of my friends and family. Okay? You're in it together. Now, I will show this to you, and a lot of people who are depressed will look at this and say, boy, I'm wretched. Because I don't even have the hardships Jim does, and, um, and I want to kill myself. You want to kill yourself because you're depressed, that's treatable. Don't blame yourself for it. Get going and get, you know, be aggressive about it. So again, all this research was done and I was brought into this because of Doug Kerr. 
Thanks to all of the patients, to Chitra for doing all of the research at the beginning, for Carrie for putting up with me now uh, that I beat on her for the last two weeks, was it? Two, nine months, nine months. Uh, ben, Carlos, Peter, and all the other members of the TM Center and, and uh, MS Clinic, thanks for your time. <laughs> Missed it by 10 minutes. What do you think, Sandy? It's OK. There you are. So Janet is over at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Yeah, you know Janet. She's a good person to know, by the way. Kennedy Krieger's amazing. And Janet, when I gave grand rounds, came up to me and she said, you know these kids that we have in Kennedy Krieger, when they come in with spinal cord injuries, they do really pretty well. They get going, they're motivated, they're excited. The people, you know, the kids that come in with transverse myelitis, there's something not right. They don't engage in activities. They don't process at the same speed as the other kids. So we have not done the studies, but I believe, Janet, and I believe that, and I believe you for asking the question, that I think it's the same kind of processes from the inflammation. But we have yet to do those studies. In part, we're not discriminating. It's just that, in part, it's very hard to come up with, you know, you know how do you diagnose depression in a kid, a uh, very young kid, and an infant, and the like. So we need better biological markers, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it, and it's a very good question. I don't have the answer, but I think...